Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Willis, and you will love economics. Fiscal policy isn't the only tool the government can use to correct economic conditions and return the economy to long-run equilibrium. When spending and tax policies aren't enough, the central bank can use monetary policy to control the money supply in the aggregate economy, which influences interest rates and can impact consumption and investment spending through borrowing, lending, and credit. But in order to understand monetary policy, which we'll cover in another video, we must first understand money. Money is the lifeblood of any economy. It fuels spending and savings, lending and borrowing, investment and credit. But there's a lot more to money than just what we see when we reach into our pockets or check our bank account balance online. Without money, economic transactions would be much more difficult. We'd be forced to rely on bartering, which is based on the exchange of one economic good for another. For example, if I were a fisherman and I needed life-saving surgery, I need to find a surgeon who could perform the exact surgery I require who needs and wants fish. If every surgeon I found wanted chicken instead of fish, I need to find a chicken farmer who needs or wants fish and barter with them so I can return to the surgeon and barter chicken for the life-saving surgery. Never mind the surgery. The hassle alone would kill me. Obviously, exchanging money for economic goods is much easier. That way, the seller can use universally accepted money to purchase whatever economic goods they need or want. There are two forms that money can take. The first is fiat money. Fiat money is defined as something that serves as money or currency and has no other important uses. Fiat money are the paper notes and coin currency that we use day to day when we make purchases with cash. It's money and that's it. It serves no other real purpose. The second is commodity money. Commodity money is something that performs the function of money, but also has an alternative non-monetary use, such as gold, silver, oil, or precious metals. Silver, for example, can be used both as currency for the purchase of economic goods, but can also be used as a metal to produce jewelry, utensils, and other items. Regardless of the form it takes, money serves three important functions. The first function that money serves is as a medium of exchange. In this capacity, money is used to buy goods and services without the complications of bartering. Quite simply, whenever you use money to buy anything, you're using money as a medium of exchange. The second function that money serves is as a unit of account. In this capacity, money is used to measure the value of goods and services. Okay, you walk into a department store to buy a pair of jeans. You only need one pair and your income is limited. You find a display of folded jeans in a variety of designs and colors and you find two pair that you like. What's the very next thing that you and every other consumer is bound to do? That's right, you check the price tag. One pair is $29. The other is $99. You can afford both, so affordability isn't an issue. What's the first thing that you assume from the price difference? Of course, you assume that the $99 pair is better quality. But is it? You weren't there when it was made. You didn't see the resources that went into making it. All you're doing is using the money needed to buy each pair to measure their comparative value. The third function that money serves is as a store of value. In this capacity, money is used to preserve or save purchasing power for future consumption. Whenever you deposit money into a savings account or financial asset, your intention is to freeze the purchasing power of that money so that it can be used at some point in the future to buy goods and services. In essence, you're storing the purchasing power of money until a later date. For the sake of monetary policy and controlling the money supply, the Federal Reserve designates money into three different M types. Each of these M types are differentiated based on the liquidity of money. Liquidity is the ease with which a financial asset can be accessed and converted into cash. In other words, how quickly can you withdraw your money from an account and turn it into cash in your pocket? You see, money is a lot like water. It can be liquid, which means it's easy to use in the form of personal checks, debit cards, and cold hard cash. Or it can be frozen solid into financial assets either in near-money accounts or checkable deposits. 
Checkable deposits are any demand deposit account against which checks or drafts of any kind may be written. For example, your checking account is a checkable deposit because you can write checks to buy goods and services, and those checks are as good as cash. Debit cards are attached to your checking account and are also as good as cash, so they count too. Near money accounts are high liquidity financial assets that can easily be converted into cash. Near money accounts can include savings accounts, mutual funds, certificates of deposit, and other securities. Generally, these accounts are interest-bearing assets, which makes them a bit more difficult to liquefy into cash. So, because the aforementioned accounts collect interest, they are near money accounts. However, because checking accounts don't collect interest, and they're as good as cash, checking accounts aren't near money accounts. The first M type of money is designated as M1 money. M1 money is liquid money in the form of coins, paper currency, and checkable deposits, including checking accounts and debit accounts. This type of money has the highest liquidity and is used as a medium of exchange. Put simply, M1 includes cash, debit cards, checks, and all money held in checking account balances. The second M type of money is designated as M2 money. M2 money are near money accounts, including savings deposits, money market accounts, certificates of deposit, mutual funds, bonds, and other securities. This type of money has a medium liquidity and is mostly used as a store of value. M2 money accounts are interest-bearing assets, which means they collect an interest rate over time. This rate earns profits for the investor who owns the account. However, this also means that checks cannot be drawn against these accounts, and so it's slightly more difficult to liquefy these assets, leading to a medium liquidity. Also, M2 accounts have a modest to low balance, usually below $100,000. Put simply, M2 includes savings accounts and all interest-bearing assets below $100,000 in value. The third M type of money is designated as M3 money. M3 money are near money accounts, including savings deposits, money market accounts, certificates of deposit, mutual funds, bonds, and other securities. This type of money has a low liquidity and is mostly used as a unit of account. Just like M2 money, M3 money accounts are interest-bearing assets, which means that checks cannot be drawn against these accounts, making it difficult to liquefy these assets. However, M3 accounts have the largest balances of any money type, generally above $100,000, but usually in the millions of dollars. This makes it extremely difficult to liquefy these assets, leading to a low liquidity. With such large sums frozen in M3 accounts, most of the economy's money supply rests in this money type. Investors who own these accounts generally use them to store money as part of an extensive portfolio and don't often liquefy them to make purchases. As a result, M3 is used mostly as a unit of account. Put simply, M3 includes savings accounts and all interest-bearing assets above $100,000. I had mentioned that debit cards are designated as M1 money, but what about that other plastic card we use so often? Just like debit cards, credit cards are used easily for the purchase of goods and services, but they're neither M1, M2, or M3 money. In fact, they're not money at all. Credit cards are actually short-term loans with excessive interest rates. They are used in place of M1 when cash is not available and consumers want to spend beyond their available income. And they're not M2 or M3 because they're used entirely for spending and not used for savings or financial investments. Think about it. You go shopping for a new smartphone. And because the price is more than you have available in your M1 checking account, you use your credit card instead of your debit card. The store swipes your credit card. And you wait as the card company is notified that you want to purchase a smartphone. The credit card company has provided you with a max. This means that they have agreed to lend you a sum of money over the short term and the max is the limit of the loan amount. You can borrow all of it, some of it, or none of it. It's up to you. However, if you use the credit card at any time, you borrow money from the credit card company and are now obligated to pay that sum back, plus any interest attached to the card. Meanwhile, back at the store, the cashier receives a notification from the credit card company that says your charge or your request for a loan to pay for the smartphone has been approved. Was any money taken from your checking account? From your savings account? From a financial asset in your name? Nope. Instead, you used money that was never yours to begin with. And now, 
you're on the hook to pay it back or else. Credit cards are loans, not money, and therefore are not part of the M1, M2, or M3 types of money. Lastly, while money can be stored in M2 and M3 interest-bearing near-money accounts, it can also be stored in two common financial assets, bonds and stocks. Bonds are debt investments in which an investor loans money to an entity for a defined period of time. Bonds are typically issued by corporate firms, banks, and governments, and the bonds can be bought by anyone with disposable income. When the investor buys the bond, the firm, bank, or government pays the investor a percentage of the principal of the bond at regular intervals. These payments add up over time to earnings for the investor that can be used as disposable income. In return, the entity that has issued the bond can use the money it sold the bond for in any way it sees fit as long as it pays back the investor when the bond becomes mature, or in other words, when it is time to pay the loan back. Here's how it works. You are a consumer and you have extra disposable income that you're looking to invest in an asset. Apple announces that they're selling bonds to investors on the open market. The maturity rate of each bond is 10 years. The price of each bond is $1,000. And Apple is willing to pay a 5% interest rate annually to anyone who buys their bonds. You jump on the deal and buy a bond from Apple at a price of $1,000. You hand Apple $1,000. Apple hands you a certificate that essentially is an IOU. As long as you hold that bond, you are entitled to $50 every year or 5% interest annually for the next 10 years, which adds up to $500 over the life of the bond. Meanwhile, Apple can use the $1,000 you paid for the bond in any way they see fit. Maybe they'll use it to hire new workers, build new stores, or restock their inventories. Perhaps they'll invest it in new technologies, or maybe they'll just buy a new car for all their executives. It doesn't matter, as long as they pay you back in 10 years. However, they have an incentive to do something productive and profitable with that money because it will make it easier to pay you back over time. Stocks are slightly different. Stocks are investments that represent a share of ownership in a corporate firm. You see, when a company needs capital, it can sell shares of stock to investors who are willing to invest their money in the firm. When an investor buys a share of stock, they loan money to the firm for an indefinite period of time. Each share of stock purchased by the investor is worth some portion of ownership in the firm, which entitles the shareholder to a share of the profits. These are called dividends. Dividends are a share of the corporate profits owed to a shareholder. Depending on the amount of shares that the investor owns, they are entitled to a portion of the firm's profits. The more stock owned, the higher the dividends earned. The less stock owned, the fewer the dividends earned. The firm will take the capital it has accumulated from selling its stock and reinvest in themselves in an attempt to scale their production and increase their profits. After all, it has an incentive to do something productive and profitable with that money because it has shareholders who have invested in the firm and expect dividends in return. If the company becomes more profitable over time, the value of its stock will grow and the price to purchase shares in the stock market will increase. This opens up the second opportunity for shareholders to generate income from stock, capital gains. Capital gains are the profits earned when shares of stock are sold at a higher price than they were purchased for. If a share of stock was purchased at a price of $100, but after some time, the firm gains value and the price climbs to $1,000. A shareholder can sell his shares to another investor and earn $900 in capital gains per share he sells. In addition to any dividends he might have earned, that also generates income for the shareholder. And that's money and financial assets. Be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red button below so you can receive alerts about new videos when they become available. If you enjoy the channel or find my videos useful, be sure to like the video and feel free to leave a comment below. We have full video lectures on every topic in macro and microeconomics, as well as quick macro and micro minute videos for cram sessions and quick reviews. If you'd like to learn more, you can click here for my video on the money market, or you can click here for my macro minute video on the M types of money. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on You Will Love Economics.